So still just trying to find a time of the day that works I can consistently do. That, yeah. I'm thinking mid-arvo, but it's just such a shit time. Because, well, I can whinge about it or not, hey? Anyway, uh, so the, and the consequence of that is that the, you know, I'm, I'm behind a couple of days now. A couple of days, one, two, three, four. Yeah, there you go, four days. <coughs> Anyway, so, um, yeah, so hit the gym, um, and then after that, went and hung out with Beck, and, um, yeah, she, she came back and she grabbed coffee, and we, it was so nice, we just sat out the front, and, um, yeah, and just, just, it was, it's, it's such a, such a beautiful way to start the day, hey, like, we both really enjoy it, and we just get to kind of catch up and touch base with each other, um, and then, unfortunately, that got cut short, <laughs> With um, with the kids screaming and yelling inside, and we were going, hey, "What is going on?" So we went inside, and um, Beck's sister's a hairdresser, and gave the kids like a mannequin that they can practice doing hair on, and um, technically it's Lexi's, um, but the other kids obviously participated in it quite a lot. This one particular time, Tilly wanted to do the mannequin's hair as well, uh, and it's typical that you know they always want to do it when someone else in the family wants to be doing the same particular activity, be it whatever that activity is. And um, in this instance, Lexi didn't want to share with, with Tilly. And, you know, we gave him a whole heap of options. Hey, we're like, you know, you guys can set timers and you can have a turn and she can have a turn. And no, nah, okay, well, listen, there's a lot of hair on that mannequin. How about we do half-half? Uh, no. Nah. And in the end, Lexi spat the dummy and ran and cried in bed. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Good for a laugh at least, eh? Um, yeah, so it was funny. Uh, so then I caught up on some podcasts from the day before after that. And then I would listen to the Lexi thing. It was really good to end up resolving it with her. You know, and one of the things that Beck and I always iterate is that we don't want our kids to feel bad for what they're feeling. You know, sure, like, you're feeling frustrated, frustrated and emotion, but we don't want to, like, demonize them or make them feel like they're isolated because of those emotions. So making sure, like, we're actually spending some time with them and going, hey, like, you know, what's going on? Um, like, how did you get to that point? Why are you frustrated? Why are you upset? And uh, that's been good. So, yeah, it's kind of did that with her and then just said to her, I was like, babe, listen, I want you to come play. We want you to be with us as a family. Like, when you're ready, you come out and play, please. And, uh, and and she did, and that was really cool. So yeah, anyway. So then um, I podcasted on the day before, and um, I had a meeting with Sue. So Great Game of Business is the methodology that we're using to roll out the open book management. Because I mean, the thing is, is as well is right. So let's just think about the the process of open book management. Is that we share our numbers really openly with the team now. So if we're making an absolute shitload of money and they're not, sure, and I understand, yes, I've got the risk and, you know, and yes, we did sell our house so we had the money to be able to, you know, float and have some, some fallback and absorb any, like, unforeseen costs, which there always are. And yes, you know, I'm the director and I've got the liability and yes, all these sorts of things and I agree with all of those things. But the reality of life is that People might see that, and especially people in your team might uh, go, yeah, sure, like I understand that, but they still look at what they're, what they're receiving for their remuneration and they go, yeah, but you're getting more. And I get that. So for us, it's a matter of going, okay, I've got to go open book management because we want the team to see exactly how the business operates and, and functions. And maybe this is a poor substitute for good leadership. Actually, no, because I always think with leadership, it, it's, it's an element of openness and, and um, vulnerability that's required. So I don't. And as well, I think we publicly listed companies operate this way anyway. So why can't you as a private company do it? So that, that's my thought there. You know, if, if I'm not able to lead a private company in that sense, well, how could I expect to be able to lead a public company? Not to say that's where I want to go, but, you know, for the most part, CEOs of publicly listed companies are 
by way of the nature of their position, and some people probably this doesn't apply to, but I'd say for the most part, you don't get to that position without being a good leader. So my thoughts are, if they're able to do it, then why why am I exempt from that same set of rules, you know? So, hmm. So anyway, so okay, so if I'm publicly open with, uh, not publicly, if if I'm open with my team about our financials and all our costs and our expenses, well then, one, it forces me to be able to justify all the costs and be a lot more intentional about how we're spending our money, which is very important. Uh, One second. Um, Sorry, I was just coughing. And then it also requires me to have to be, um, you know, to... uh, Oh gosh, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Yeah, to be very intentional with our funds, and you know, and to be able to then present that with a team to the team, and and the knowledge is, if I'm not, if I'm not really intentional with our with our money, well, then they're not going to trust me, right? But then it's also going, okay, well, like you know, you guys, you guys, I want you guys to have something to strive for as well. So then there has to be an element of, okay, like if we hit this profitability above that, let's share that profit with with the team, you know, so. So it that that feels good, um, and yeah, the whole methodology is something that I I certainly subscribe to. I feel like it's probably been a missing piece of the sort of way I want to run run our business for for a long time. When we started the business, like I've always had a preference toward, um, uh, I guess openness, and so when we started the business, you know, everyone could see our financials. When I say financials, not financials, but everyone could see the like the sales, and you know, none of that was hidden. And the and the team got a lot of value out of that. And then when we, as we kind of grew, there were a few little red flags with some of our team, and you know, and so unfortunately, what I did was I, I let one person's poor character change how we operate as a, as a collective, and everyone suffered. Really, I should have got better at identify who's the right people we want on our team, rather than rather than adapting how we treat our entire team, and so that's a lesson in itself. But yeah, anyway, so caught up with Sue, and she um, she finally out uh, finally. Gosh, that sounds bad. No, that's not, that's not the case at all. Sorry, um, we are finally at the point where we're doing the specific numbers around how we do the, the the what's called a gain share. So it's not profit share because there's a profit baseline. But then above the profitability baseline, then there is a gain that is shared across the, the team. So it's it's a gain in excess of the required profit for the business to be healthy. Uh, and then we share that across the team. So yeah, so I'm not gonna lie, it, it did it did confuse me a bit. And I've got a fair bit of reading to get through to get my head around that. So that's um yeah, so that was that. Uh, and then you know what? Like one of the things that I've noticed is a second order effect of, of getting, um, being on the journey of like health and fitness is that I just want everything in order. Like now I'm starting to get my health in order and my like my life for the most part in order. Now I'm looking around, I'm just like, man, I just, I want my workplace in, my workspace in order. I want my, um, my bedroom in order. I want my house in order. And, and I'm not being a pirate about it, but, um, I would rather spend the time having the the place in order so that I can then function really really efficiently. You know, um, yeah. So anyway, on the back of that, what I did was I reorganized my desk. Actually, here, have a look. Um, so this is quiet. Oh shoot, where are we? Okay, yeah. Um, so uh, yeah. So what I did was I uh, mounted this whiteboard that took us you now a little while to kind of work on that, but just, I mean, I had shit everywhere and like loose bits of paper and all that sort of thing. And, um, and even just how my, uh, how the camera was mounted and stuff was a real pain in the ass. So now it's flexible so I can do stuff like that and show everyone. So yeah, so organize the desk. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, so organize that and it's really nice to just be able to bin a ton of shit that I know I don't need anymore. Um, organize the desk, keep that in, that in order. And then, um, so Charlene, she's our administrator. She's based in the Philippines. An absolute asset to our business. Honestly, she is so incredible. Um, Charlene, if you're listening to this, I love you. Thank you very, very much. Um, so we're setting up with her with a uh, with an Australian mobile number that she can access uh, from her computer and in the Philippines so she can make phone calls to suppliers or text messages and, and those things, which is going to be really, really 
helpful for her. Um, so that's really cool. Um, and then that, um, oh, hang on a sec. Oh, no, we're good. It's just the neighbours. Um, yeah, and then Beck and I, <laughs> uh, we, we ended up, um, we, we were planning on, on getting lucky that night. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, we know, like, uh, like alcohol's an, a, 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 it was a it, in, not inhibitor, what is it? Yeah. No, whatever. You just get loose, yeah. And it's great. Like, we always have so much better sex when, when we're, uh, we get on the turps a little. So, um, you know, I poured us a couple gins and, and then, you know, and the beauty of it, not to say that it's necessarily a, um, a particularly like positive or negative outcome as much as it is, it's, it's the outcome we had was that instead of, um, instead of having the night to ourselves where we just, we, um, got back on the sex train, um, because obviously post vasectomy, post birth, like you guys know what it's like. Well, for those who have been there, yeah. So we <laughs> we ended up having this like massive conversation around um, how how we feel about how we're going with the kids, and and that was really interesting. And we're both, you know, I think it was really good for us both to have a conversation around, um, you know, how we feel like we're showing up for the kids. And we're both on the same page there where we certainly felt like we could be doing better. I remember there was this quote that said, you know, like, parenting's only hard for good parents. And and I get that. Um, it's hard to not beat yourself up, eh? Because you see, you look back in hindsight and, man, there's just so much that, you know, I... Would we have our time again um, with the kids? Definitely. There's plenty we'd do differently. Um, I think the thing we feel most guilty for is for for Tilly's early years. You know, like we we really you know we had someone who was stay you know um, in home carer. She was really great. Like we nothing against her whatsoever. You know, she was really great, but it wasn't us. Like we weren't there. You know, and the more you learn about like attachment and. Oh, I think my my screen's just gone dead. I really hope that hasn't stopped the recording. No, sweet. The more you learn about attachment and and all that with kids, the more you realise that man, it's so important for you to be there for your kids in their in their early years. And it's just you know, and we weren't we 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 weren't there, especially for the first like you know twelve months, you know. And so we're we're conscious of that. Um, and then as well, just like man, as as we, as we kind of like started to get the, the the pressures of business and, you know, we're un, in uncharted waters and we'd moved house and, you know, like, yeah, just all of it, all of it. Like there was a lot of pressure and, and I really feel like Tilly cop the most of the, the brunt there. And it's something that we're really mindful of too. You know, like Tilly's got such a short fuse and, and we kind of see it expressed Um, like she always, she always like compares to, um, she always compares, hang on a second, oh yeah, that's right, yeah, 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 hang on, I think I'm just missing something, get out of it, I can't remember if this was the day, and this is why I, d- I don't like having to reach so far back in my memory. I think it might have been this day that, that Beck went on a date with with Tilly. This week she wanted to take a, take each of the kids out on a, on a one-on-one date. And with Tilly, um, she went out and, 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 you know, there's been some questions that we've, well, Beck's been asking the kids every time she takes them out is like, one thing she asked Tills is, you know, what do you like about yourself and what don't you like about yourself? And we've noticed as well, like, oh, so so what happened was Tilly was just like, oh, you know, I don't like my hair. And she just sobbed in front of Beck. And Beck's like, you're kidding. She's like, well, 
you know, what don't you like about your hair? And she's like, it's not like Lexi's. You know, she's forever comparing and looking, you know, and I'm just like, how does that happen as, as a four-year-old? You know, like, it's crazy. I don't know, it's hard to not blame yourself for that, if I'm to be honest. But, yeah, anyway. It's something that we're conscious of, and it's it's something that we're, we're now like, yeah, sure, if I had my time again, I'd go back and, well, I don't know, I still would have been in, as fucked up, so maybe I wouldn't have changed anything, but I don't know. I certainly wish that we didn't dump our shit on a four-year-old, or at the time, probably like a two-year-old. You know, and it's, it, 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 it is incredible. It blows my mind how a tiny human, you know, two, three, four years old, can break a fully grown adult. And they do. And it's not the kid's fault. And it's incredible. Yeah. But anyway, so we, we had a, we had a big heart to heart about that and, and just that it's one of those things where like, you know what, we know if we're not patient, if we don't start being more patient and more, more grounded with the, with the kids, then we're just going to make more damage, you know, and it's just, it's going to be shit. So something that I'm mindful of, um, you know, and both Beck and I are on the same page. We both know we could have done better. And maybe that's too judgmental or whatever, but I, I don't think so. I think that... I know what the healthy thought is now is is not rum, rum, ruminating, yeah, on, like, the mistakes we've paid, but... No, mistakes we've made, but then going, okay, well, we know what we're dealing with now. What are we doing going forward? You know, and the whole, like... Man, just love. Just I remember someone saying, you know, between the ages of one and seven, treat your children like royalty, and then from seven to fourteen, treat them like slaves. You know, and it doesn't mean that you treat your kids like shit, right? But one to seven, man, build that esteem, just build that like that absolute just adoration and love and joy and and remember I've said it before, but I remember Mum saying to us like, you know, you have to love your kids, but you have to enjoy them as well. So you build that as build that self esteem and identity in them, and then you you teach them how to work hard, and you teach them to be to be. It doesn't mean that you neglect that either as well during those formative years, but you you certainly um you you build that esteem in them, and I feel like we just fucked up for the first few years. Yeah. Anyway, that was pretty much that. That was the day. Yeah. Anyway. Um, to be honest, I don't even know if we had sex that night, but yeah, it was, that's, you know, it's what, four nights ago. My memory's not that great. <laughs>